From the Oregon State University Extension Service, this is Pollination, a podcast that tells the stories of researchers, land managers, and concerned citizens making bold strides to improve the health of pollinators. I'm your host, Dr. Adoni Melithopoulos, Assistant Professor in Pollinator Health in the Department of Horticulture. Oregon, over the past month, has become depopulated of commercial honeybee colonies, but Don't worry, they're okay. They've just headed south to pollinate California almonds. And as we've heard in previous episodes, there's been huge investment in creating pollinator habitat in and around California almond orchards. This kind of investment hasn't been matched here in Oregon, and this is in part because we have such diverse agriculture, so there's always a pollen and nectar resources around. Nonetheless, when those bees come back in March and get ready to pollinate blueberries, it'd be really helpful if there was a little bit more pollinator habitat in and around those fields. Well, my next guest is a real pro in doing this. George Kaufman um, works for AgriCare, and um, I met him out at Humbug Farm in Independence, Oregon, where they've made some really amazing investments in a large-scale commercial blueberry field in terms of pollinator habitat. Lots of different shrub species, also four flowering forbs, and in this episode, we're going to hear about how they do it. You know how they're able to uh, kind of establish these plots, maintain them, and uh, keep them going uh, for years. You know, the the plot that we visited in this episode has been growing for a number of years and looks fantastic. And before we get started on this episode, I just want to mention that this uh, episode is part of a larger Western IPM Center grant looking at integrated pest management and pollinator protection in agriculture land. So this is connected to that episode we had earlier with uh, uh, Nico from Peoria Gardens talking about integrated pest management and pollinator health in nurseries. The goal of these episodes is to really give growers some ideas and tools on how to help pollinators uh, at the same time as protecting their crops um, and some innovative solutions from the ground up. So without further ado, let's go to Independence, Oregon to learn about pollinator habitat this week on pollination. On this side, a little less muddy. Okay, great. So here we are. We're uh, so welcome, George. Welcome to Pollination. Thank you. Thank so you. where where are we right now? Uh, well, we're in Independence, Oregon, at Humbug Farm. Um, it's uh, well, this and the sister farm across the road. It's about a thousand acres of organic blueberries, another twelve hundred acres of hazelnuts that are conventionally grown. Uh huh. Um, and it's a farm that we planted about uh, eight years ago. Okay, this is what an eight year old uh, blueberry um, planting looks like. Okay, great. But there's something peculiar right in front of us. This does not look like a row of blueberries. No, no. We actually, uh, down the middle of both farms, we, instead of planting uh, a row of blueberries, we just took that row and instead put um, various species of native uh, flowering plants um, with the intention of helping support the, the native insects and, you know, bees and native pollinators, native beneficial predatory insects. Um, and so just, yeah, set a little ground aside for that purpose. So we're, yeah, I mean, I imagine for some people, like I'm looking at this and it's like, man, we lost a low, you know, a row of blueberries to this. Or I imagine with other people putting a hedgerow in, it's like in the way of the equipment. Why did you guys decide to, and this is a beautiful, I have to say, just looking at it, this is like, this is the textbook definition of like how to do a, a hedgerow. This is a, it's outstanding. So why did you guys go to so much trouble to do this? Yeah, so this, this hedgerow is a little unusual because it, it really does go right down the middle of a productive ground. It, it splits a farm in half. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of our plantings you'll see are on the, you know, the outside, the outskirts of the farm where there's maybe an unusual sized you know, corner or something or the hill, hill's too steep to farm. Um, but really, uh, when this farm was planted, um, the, the owner of the farm, um, you know, conservation like this, sustainability, it really is a big part of their core values, uh, something they actually believed in and Uh something that they actually um, put their mouth or their money where their mouth was, right? And so um, they, um, it really, we didn't know, I guess, what the benefits were going to be actually to the farm, but we knew that by putting um, this hedgerow in that we could support the native insects. Uh, Previously, this farm was uh, basically just large blocks of, you know, monoculture. It still is. Um, but this is, you know, plants like 
corn, uh, grass seed, peppermint, things that are rotated and um, not always real supportive for, for the local insect populations. And so we knew by taking, uh, by putting a permanent um, hedgerow here that we could really, you know, help support and, and boost back those, those beneficial number, uh, insect numbers that probably, you know, declined over the, the many decades of farming here. And, um, well, you know, I have to say the reason why this looks like a textbook, you know, um, examples, the establishment is so carefully done. Sometimes I think, you know, people will put shrubs in the mm -hmm. ground and hope it comes. But here we've got a good weed, we've got good weed control. Mm -hmm. There's some irrigation going on these plants? Uh, there is, I don't, we don't use it too much anymore. It's more just for establishment. For establishment. Mm -hmm. I imagine that's the thing at the establishment phase for yes. a lot of plants, um, you know, you don't need it after that. As soon as they establish, they're good with these kinds of shrubs. We got spirea here, it looks like. Yes, yep. And I think all these shrubs in here are native to the valley here, so they're used to hot, dry summers. And so uh, once they get established, yeah, we don't, we don't water. Um, we just we try to keep our inputs at a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, this, because this is a row of blueberries and an organic farm, it uh, or was gonna be a row of blueberries originally, there's uh, irrigation installed, there's weed fabric installed. Mm -hmm. um, and then instead of putting blueberry holes, we just, we put uh, these pollinator plants. And the weed fabric has made it really easy to control the weeds, um, and I think that's, uh, just the long-term upkeep of these hedgerows, I think, is maybe a big reason why people are a little bit scared or nervous about doing these projects. So you really got to do them, do it right up front. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, by doing this weed fabric, we have very minimal um, weeding that has to be done every year. Uh, you can see it right here. We got some. Look at roses. Yeah, like exactly. Yeah. We got roses in front of us. Um, they filled in their little hole nicely. With the a bird's fabric. nest right in the middle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's neat. Yeah, so there, there's no weeds that are going to be coming through here. Well, I'm, um, I imagine this is the problem. A lot, I've seen this in the valley repeatedly. Someone puts in a pollinator, you know, hedgerow or something with shrubs, mm -hmm. and then the blackberries just, and I don't see a, how old is this? Uh, almost eight years old. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I don't see any patches of blackberry in mm -hmm. here. This is really clean. Yeah, um, and, and this was this was planted in the middle of a, of a farm that had been, you know, um, managed very well for many years. So there isn't gonna be a lot of blackberries. Uh, if you go on other parts of the farm where, on the, where we plant the outskirts, that's where you have blackberries. Mm -hmm. And so those, um, you know, a few come, you know, pop in every year. We cut them back. Um, we do use some herbicides, you know, on spot, to spot spray to get, yeah, yeah. to get rid of those. Um, because if, if you don't, you come back five years from now, it's all you're going to have is blackberries. It's all you're going to have so, is blackberries. So, yeah, so tell us a little bit about, so uh, for, for something like blackberry management, um, I guess you just, it's a yearly thing. You're going to have to come through and just, even when it's well established, mm -hmm. the blackberries could just go right through everything. So you, I imagine coming by here once a year, what's it, what time of year are you kind of like thinking about blackberry control? Um, fall, uh, late fall into early winter is a great time because most of the plants have lost their leaves, but the blackberries still have their leaves on. So they stick out like a sore thumb. They're, oh, they're very obvious. Okay. Um, they're the only about green plant that's out there. So they're really easy to see, really easy to come and clip back. Um, and then, um, you know, like I said, we do use some herbicides. So, um, you know, spring when they start to grow back, that's a good time to just go and hit, you know, hit just the blackberries with a little spot spray and, and to kind of kill that plant. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, you could try to pull or dig out the plant. But for us, we, we manage quite a few acres of habitat. And so we have to make it, um, make as easy and, and quick as possible. Being in the blueberry business and just being really good agronomist, you clearly know how to get uh, weed fabric down in an efficient way. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about this? And I imagine for m many people, unless they're growers, this is this is impossible to do like this. Yeah. So we have a special machine that comes in and, and you know lays down fabric on both sides of the mound, and then it's it's closed up uh, with fabric staples, and then we put a hole on top for the plant. Um, you know, I, I suppose if you didn't have that machine, you could you know you could go out and purchase a, a strip of weed fabric, um, and then you just want to make sure you secure it well, right? Mm -hmm. So you just gotta uh, you probably want to put dirt on the edge just so you don't have wind coming in and, and lifting it up and take taking it away. Make sure you use you know fabric staples things like that to, to keep it secured. Um, that's a big thing. And then um, you're gonna have, you know, voles here and there that like to run underneath it, but for the most part. Yeah, it, how, long, it, how long will this last? Um, I mean, this this is eight years old here. It's still in really it good looks shape. It great. Um, yeah. uh, you can kind of see the blueberry fabric behind us. It's a little bit more beat up because we've ran machine harvesters over it. Uh -huh. We've opened and closed it. Uh -huh. But I mean, th this has, you know, easily another 10, 15 years on it. I, th I think this is gonna last us a while. Now, I, I guess one of the things in consideration when you're in blueberries or small fruits is spotted wing drosophila, and I mm -hmm. guess some of these 
some plants that are good for bees, blackberries a great example, yeah, yeah. Uh, can be a host. Uh, tell us a little bit about plant selection and making sure it's compatible with the growing system. Yeah, so if you walk along this hedgerow, you'll notice none of these uh, plants fruit. Um, so unfortunately that eliminates quite a few plants, but mm -hmm. um, we have, you know, roses, we have uh, spirea, Pacific nine bark. Oh yeah. Um, mock orange. Uh, there, there's a pretty wide variety of plants that you can use still that don't, that don't fruit. Uh -huh. um, and obviously, yeah, we didn't, we didn't want our, um, our native pollinator habitats to end up being a, a, you know, a host site for pests. And so we carefully selected plants. Um, you know, Oregon State has a great, great publication publications on you know which plants host you know spotted drosophila if there's mm -hmm. other diseases or insects people are worried about they get, that's extension a great resource for that now uh, i guess the other part of this there's all sorts of native pollinators that are going to come here but uh imagine agricare and the owner of this uh farm rent a lot of honeybee colonies what have been the beekeepers receptions uh the reception to having these hedgerows and these uh in um these flowering hedgerows in place. Yeah, it, it's been it's been good. Um, so it's it's no secret that blueberries are hard on honeybees, right? They're just their their pollen and nectar just aren't real nutritious. It's a lot of work for the bees to get the pollen and nectar out. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of these hedgerows uh, begin to bloom about the second half of uh, blueberry bloom. So mm -hmm. about the second half of the honeybees being in here, and. Um, and so that, that gives the, the honeybees an alternate source, right? It's, it's not enough ground that it's gonna distract from the, the blueberry pollination, um, but it's enough to kind of help boost up the health and then the nutrition um, of the hives. And so we're actually gonna be working this year to kind of quantify that better and get a better idea, you know, how much um, good these habitats are doing for honeybees. Mm -hmm. um, but we expect that, you know, we'll see stronger colonies leaving the farm when they're, you know, on a farm that has, you know, good um, pollinator habitat, good blooming plants. Um, as opposed to a farm that you know does not have any alternate sources of food other than blueberry. I can just imagine that that is a concern. Like if I was a blueberry grower, if mm -hmm. I put too much, I'd be worried about putting in flowering plants around bloom that it, there are some varieties of blueberry I understand. The bees really, if you have some blooming maple close by, they may leave. And so we, how, yeah, tell us a little bit about that process. I, I imagine you, you're not, you've got a balance between area Mm -hmm. And then you've got the, you don't have the bloom right up against mm -hmm. when your uh, bloom starts for your blueberries. Yeah, yeah. So things like blooming maple, uh, neighboring mustard field, th those are really hard to compete with, right? And those are, there's enough plants, uh, a large mustard field can just draw lots of honeybees away where it does have a detrimental effect on the pollination blueberries. With our hedgerows, um, our, our pollinating habitat, pollinating habitat makes up about um, five percent or so of the farm acreage, mm -hmm. um, and so on a you know thousand acre blueberry farm, that's about forty acres of habitat. That's not blooming all at once, right? We these hedgerows are pretty dense. There's quite a few flowers in them, um, and so yes, there's there's bees on in that second half, but it, the plants are just beginning to bloom. There's there's not lots and lots of blooms on the on the hedgerows, um, and obviously. Uh, so you have a portion of bees that go on these hedgerows, but um, it's not enough or it's, we're, we feel like it's being, you know, detracting from, from the, the blueberry bloom. And um, there's only so much pollen and nectar out here that, you know, once they take it that morning or you know, that day, that they, they're going to go somewhere else so they can find, you know, the food sources. Well, and I, I guess, you know, there is the honeybees and I, I it, you know, I, it's always great to, you know, that there's a um, blueberry growers you know, doing something to help their beekeepers because it is a difficult pollination. Mm -hmm. but, but I imagine the flip side is there may be some benefit that you, you know, clearly getting bumblebee densities high in a commercial blueberry field is difficult. They're a great pollinator, mm -hmm. but just getting the numbers high enough. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand you guys are e actually tracking native bee populations. Tell us a little bit about that effort. Yeah, so we've pretty closely tracked about the last five or six years. Um, native bees, native beneficial insects over the period of basically from late March or early April into September. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of watching what those numbers and those populations have done. Uh, we've seen, um, as these farms have got established and matured, we've seen about a, a 28, 30% increase in uh, the counts on beneficial insects every year. So we're growing these populations, you know, very quickly. Um, and then uh, we, we're starting to observe um, bumblebees sticking around the entire summer, right? 
Um, before they would stick around during you know blueberry bloom and they'd stick around maybe while we had some of our hedgerows blooming but then they eventually they just kind of disappear mm -hmm. and um, we're doing a better job of incorporating late season um, uh, blooming plants uh -huh. and and so um, what we've seen is is there's enough you know floral uh, resources for these bees that they're sticking around right and so they're hopefully having lots of babies and then you know we're having lots of queens overwintering on our farm, and so when they come out, they're right here on our farm. Oh, and so right. that, that's kind of why we want to keep them around all, you know, all, all summer long, so they, they overwinter here. Um, and so we're seeing, you know, we've compared this farm to other farms of ours that don't have this mature of habitat, don't have this much habitat, and we're seeing uh, maybe five, you know, five, five to 10% more of our pollination is done by native bees that's amazing. Than a farm that has wow. no that has no habitat next to it. So you're getting this kind of free. Well, not free. I mean, you're having this is a, this is you got to put the put the habitat in yeah. place. But you're, it is this uh, after you make this investment, you're getting a, a trickle of uh, uh, free pollination services. Yes. So maybe superior pollination services. Absolutely. Like yes. Yep. Ah, that's great. And um, we've looked at like aphid numbers. Um, the closer you get to the hedgerows, the fewer aphids there are, right? Because you're having more of those parasitoid wasps and more of those predatory insects as adults maybe that feed on the, the pollen and nectar and then come out here and lay their eggs you know, on the aphids or in the aphids or their babies are you know, um, feeding on the aphids. And so we're actually seeing fewer aphids closer to these habitats. And so that's, um, aphids can be, in the right circumstance, they can be a, a pretty bad pest on, on, especially organic blueberries. We don't have a lot of tools to, to fight them. And so that's a really important, uh, really important benefit we're getting is, is you know, pest control. You know, I was just part of a ag leadership course. I just, you know, I was on my way back from Salem and we uh -huh. had an opportunity to meet here. And I guess one of the things is, uh, you know, a lot of uh, um, people in cities don't really recognize how much uh, growers are doing to help pollinators. Mm -hmm. And I guess, is, is there any other ways that you get recognized for doing this work? It's, like, it, it's a great story. It, it's, it's shocking that it's taken me so long before I've done an episode with you because this is just, I, I'm, folks, I'm just telling you, as far as the eye can see, there's a, a pollinator hedgerow. And so, um, it, um, is that important to you guys? Or it, it sounds like just controlling aphids, keeping beekeepers mm -hmm. happy, all this doesn't involve the public at all. But um, is there a way in which the consumers get to know about, uh, about these efforts? A couple of ways. Um... This farm was a part of the was a flagship farm for the Oregon Bee Project, and then it's also certified uh, Bee Better, which is a certification created by the Xerces Society. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically, uh, we're we're certified that we have practices uh, that we have habitat on the farm that supports um, you know beneficial insects. Mm -hmm. And so part part of that is you know just the number of acres or the percentage of our farm that's uh, allocated toward beneficial habitats. Um, part of it's just the different. Uh, you know, pest control products we use on our farm, it's, you know, um, we can only use certain things certain times a year. Um, and then just buffers between uh, our blueberry plants and, and, and the native habitat, making sure that we don't have any spray drift or anything like that. And so um, about two or three years ago, the first Be Better Certified Blueberries came off this farm. Um, it's something that you can find, you know, in the store in, in the summertime. Mm -hmm. um, homegrown Organics is one of the main uh, uh, labels out there and there, there'll be like a little be better certified uh, sticker on there and so uh, that's that's a great way to support farms like us that, who are, that are doing the work is by you know buying our product that's certified be better um, yeah you can I, you, you can see the amount of investment and effort mm -hmm. that goes to get mm -hmm. that certification absolutely yeah so it's it's something that um, it aligned with our core values anyway what the farm was doing already and so mm -hmm. it it wasn't too much of a stretch to get that certification um, you know, a farm that's that's not doing anything, it, it's it's attainable, but there's gonna they'll have to make some changes, put in some habitat, and maintain that habitat. Well, I right now I can see the blueberries. Um, um, we're 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 recording this uh, um, just in in the middle of February. Um, how far along are they? How are they, how are blueberries looking right now? Uh, they're looking good. You can kind of see that the buds are swollen a little bit, but we're still uh, this variety is still probably. Oh, a um, month and a half away from, from breaking bud and, and starting to bloom. But yeah, the majority of our bloom is in the month of April and in, into May. And that's when I, I imagine you're always busy, but things really get moving for you at that point. Do you ever get a chance to stop and 
a smell the roses, so to speak. Do you see any, is there any bees that you see that you're really excited to see? Um, yeah, if you follow me around here on the farm, you'll see that I, 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 I always stop at the hedgerows. I just, it's fascinating all summer, oh, spring into summer, just different blooming plants. And um, I love, I love bumblebees. I really love um, when there's a cloud of, um, like parasitoid wasps or cloud of really tiny insects <laughs> that just are surrounding like a like a ceanothus or some kind of bush that uh -huh. you know like that. Um, for me, that's neat because you don't really if you don't take time to see that you won't see those. But you realize um, that's where that's where the benefits coming in is. It's just the mass of a number of insects, beneficial insects that we're supporting with these hedgerows, and then and knowing that you know they're going to fly out into our crop and they're going to feed on the aphids or they're going to you know lay eggs in the aphids and, and help us control that. And so. Um, yeah, <laughs> I spend a decent amount of time smelling roses. It's it's a favorite part of my job. Well, I have maybe this is the last question. Maybe this is an, an involved question. When you walk down and you look at some of the things that you've planted in the past, in terms of ease and in terms of like benefits, what are some of your top plants in this uh, in in the hedgerows that you guys have put in? Um, top plants would probably be uh, Douglas spirea. Uh, Douglas Aster is just a, a workhorse from mm -hmm. July until it freezes, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to incorporate more goldenrod uh, just because we see so much, so many beneficial predatory insects on there. Oh, so there's, uh, I didn't realize that. So I, I'm seeing the shrubs right now, but there's forbs, perennial forbs. Yeah, you can kind well. of see there's a spot right there. It's um, uh, yeah. kind of shorter. That, Either needs to get replanted, or there's uh, like some asters that died back over the winter. I see. Yeah, okay. and you can kind of see some shorter ones up there. Mm -hmm. um, where that that's been the most difficult thing, and I think I kind of mentioned it earlier, but it's just having enough blooming plants from that July through October window. Mm -hmm. And so, really, the main plants that you're going to get at that point are going to be a lot of perennials, mm -hmm. herbaceous perennials. Um, so asters, we're going to try to include some more um, like coneflower, um, mm -hmm. goldenrod is one that we're trying to get. That's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. Because we've had it in, on a couple of our farms and they're just covered with soldier beetles and all these neat little <laughs> <laughs> insects and such. Um, but yeah. And then uh, the roses um, are good. We, we did. So I mentioned Douglas spirea. We did. I this my, my mistake. We did alpine spirea. Uh -huh. Well, that's supposed to be at a higher elevation and it's <laughs> suffering. dying. Yeah, it's suffering. It's about dead. So we'll be pulling those plants out and replacing them with some of the, mm -hmm. the later season blooming plants. So, but that's, that's really, really important that you try to find a, a wide range of blooming times. So, you know, basically from that early spring um, into up until frost or through the, fr the frost. And so um, that's one thing we've, in the past couple of years, I've been working more on is incorporating those type of plants into our hedgerows, into mm. our border habitats. Um, so we have those resources all summer long and that you can keep insects, you can continue to grow those populations. And then hopefully the intention is to have a high overwintering prop population that's yeah. there next spring, ready to, you know, start out with a bang and, and you know, because blueberry bloom is, April is a pretty cold month really. Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot going on. And so bumblebees are the main ones out there. And um, th it's, there's the queen bumblebees, you see them out there at first. There's not a lot of insects. And so you need to have high overwintering, you know, populations if you're gonna to wanna to get good good uh, pollination services, I guess, from native insects. Well, uh, I said it was the last question, but I also just, I'm looking at these roses and I imagine uh, some of these things uh, die back and they don't get in the way, but this rose looks like it, if it was left unpruned, you'd be, it'd be all over the place. Uh, um, is, is there, um, uh, every year you uh, at some point do you come through and prune some things back and so you can see about oh, a couple feet off the ground where it was cut back last year okay. so this is how high it was is two feet last year uh -huh. it's you know now a good wow eight nine feet tall <laughs> so um, they grow right back we we made the mistake last year of cutting back everything mm -hmm. and that actually that delays bloom by a couple of weeks and so we didn't quite have bloom as early as we wanted to so um what our plan is moving forward is we're going to you know tr prune back sections of it so we might come in here and, and cut you know maybe oh, half this back sense. so that way this the, the section that's left you know blooms normally and then this will bloom you know two weeks later that's actually a good thing because it helps extend your bloom time right because um, we're looking at maybe like a 20 foot little a section of roses yeah. here mm -hmm. so if you do a bit there's going to be like 10 feet or five feet that's going to be oh that's great yeah yeah, that's yeah. Our idea. so um, and then the, actually that Douglas spirea, that's another one we like to prune back because that will that delays bloom by two or three weeks and there's that kind of that window in 
May and June where it just everything's blooming. And then you start that June ju to July before the aster comes on there, it's kind of a quiet period. And mm -hmm. so if we can delay that Douglas ast the, the Douglas spirea by um, a couple of weeks, that kind of helps fill that gap in, in, in late June in the first half of July. Oh, so what a great idea. Um, there's kind of some tricks there. Um, nothing that we've grown is weedy. I mean, you can kind of see the roses are starting to creep out here, yeah. but you know, it's, it's grass right here. We mow it. Mm -hmm. They're never going to become a problem. They're, they're going to stay back there. You know, if they pop up in the grass, they'll, they'll get mowed back. So, um, Oh, it, I, when you go to hedgerows on the edge, I imagine it's one thing to manage weeds and other pressure when you mm -hmm. do have a grass. Is mm -hmm. it the same thing over there? You've got a nice, a nice grass alley where you can make sure things stay in place? Uh, no. So when we do like large plantings, like on the you know, unproductive side corners of the farm, we do use herbicides and that's, mm -hmm. um, that's the easiest way. It's a pre-emergent, keeps the weeds down. And as these plants grow and fill in, you get fewer and fewer weeds. It's really not much of a problem. You know, blackberries are going to be a problem. Um, and there's some other um, very vigorous weeds. Thistles are another one that you, you got to manage. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, once these start to fill in and grow together, there's weeds aren't too big of a problem. Okay. And they're, you know, seven, eight feet tall. These plants are so nothing really snuffs them out too much. So um, fantastic. Well, thanks mm -hmm. so much for taking the time. This yeah. is a really impressive um, uh, uh, effort that you guys are doing here. It's really uh, I'm looking forward to other other uh, growers in the valley and. Uh, beyond uh, starting to incorporate some of the, what you've learned here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. The show is produced by Quinn Sin and Neil, who's a student here at OSU in the New Media Communications Program. And the show wouldn't even be possible without the support of the Oregon Legislature, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, and Western SARE. Show notes with links mentioned on each episode are available on the website, which is at Pollination Podcast. Dot OregonState.edu. I also love hearing from you, and there's several ways to connect with me. The first one is you can visit the website and leave an episode specific comment. You can suggest a future guest or topic, or ask a question that could be featured in a future episode. But you can do the same things on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by visiting the Oregon Bee Project. Thanks so much for listening, and see you next week.